Can you still see it? Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll have to move kind of quickly today because we lost a lot of time there. Sorry about that. So last time. So last Can you still hear me? So last time we looked at uh, a distribution. It was a distribution of the sum of two dice, right? And it looked Kind of like a, a Gaussian. It was a little fat on the sides, but it had the general shape of a Gaussian. And the last thing that we mentioned was that you can combine the spin up and spin down um, and use the, the binomial theorem to get how many uh, combinations you are going to have of the spins. So this will be one, you know, if you have uh, two spins, if you have three spins, then it's gonna look something like this. Can you still see that? Yes. And so on, right? So for n spins, you can just use uh, the binomial theorem or I guess uh, Pascal's triangle. So there's this concept, it's called the multiplicity. G. Um, okay. In this case, it's going to be a function of n, the number of spins and S, the excess spin. So uh, this G is essentially uh, the number over here. So Q will be one, Q will be three, Q will be three, Q will be one. And it tells you how many different ways of arranging spins you have so that the total excess spin here will be, I guess, 2s yeah, has a particular value. So this concept is very important. Um, actually, pretty much everything that we're going to see this semester has to do with the multiplicity. How many ways? So for the sum of the two dice, you had, I think, six different ways of getting um, a seven. Uh, five different ways of getting a six or an eight. 
So this number, six, five, you know, four, is a multiplicity. So diff, uh, six different ways of getting that sum. So the sequences in general are going to be different, but the sum is going to be the same. So in the case of the spins, um, the particular sequence of spin up and spin down is going to be different, but the total number of spin ups and spin downs is going to be the same. So let's remember that concept. So the Pascal's triangle looks kind of like that, right? And we can also express it as and choose R, right? Uh, so that will be one, zero, one, one. Um, two choose zero, two choose one, two choose two, and so on. So, What is the formula to calculate the uh, number of combinations? So combinations of um, N and R is N factorial divided by R factorial times N minus R factorial. And we have probably seen that in other classes, is that right? Okay, good. So, with the number of spins, Uh, that is going to be given by, well, this is the multiplicity, right? It's the number of ways that you can arrange it. So G of N uh, and S equals capital N factorial, so the number of spins. And then uh, this one is going to be one half of n plus s factorial. We derived this one last time. You cannot see it? Um, that is weird. Oh, OK, OK. I was like, it's there. <laughs> so this is one half n minus s factorial, right? So we're using the same um, formula. So uh, if we look at the number of uh, spins up, then this is going to be uh, n up factorial n minus n up factorial this is in the denominator and in the numerator we have n factorial. 
So this is you know n minus n uh, up is the number of spin downs. So this is just n spin down. Okay, so. Fairly compact. So let's move that to the back burner. We're going to look at the case where S. So the excess spin is much smaller than the total number of spins, which is going to be the case uh, pretty much all the time. As we saw uh, last time, as you increase the number of trials n, the deviation from um, you know what you will expect to be the exact probability uh, decreases. So if you have 10 to the 22 spins, the excess spin is going to be uh, pretty tiny. So the first thing that we need is a Stirling's approximation. Have you heard about it before? Okay. So n factorial, it's a pretty difficult number to calculate because it grows really, really, really fast. So even if you have a computer, um, it probably has a limit of, I don't know, maybe 200 factorial or something like that. Um, if you get a number when you, you know, request a factorial uh, of something really big, it's the calculator is probably giving you an approximation. So the natural log of n factorial is natural log of uh, n times n minus one times n minus two, you know, all the way to one. So that's just the definition of the factorial. But because of the properties of the natural log, uh, this is natural log of, well, I guess here I'm just going to rewrite it as the product from m equals 1 to n of m, right? So this is just uh, expressing these again. Uh, but now, using the properties of the factorial, this is uh, the sum from m equals 1 to n of the natural log of m. So if n is very large, then this sum can be approximated by the integral. So it's the integral from 1 to n of the natural log of m dm. And this one um, is well known is m natural log of m minus m evaluated from one to n. So the one is going to be pretty tiny. So this is approximately equal to n natural log of n minus n. Okay. So this is the natural log of n factorial. So it's a pretty handy uh, approximation. So now 
if you want to know the value of just n factorial, not natural log, n factorial is e to the natural log of n. Uh, sorry, n natural log of n minus n. So this is e to the n natural log of n divided by e to the n. This is equal to e to the natural log of n to the n divided by e to the n. So this is just n to the n divided by e to the n. Okay, so n factorial, so I'm gonna put it over here, is approximately equal to n divided by e to the n. And again, pretty um, pretty useful approximation. So if you look at the uh, if you look at Appendix A in uh, Kittel and Cromer, they have a, a more precise approximation. Um, so they have an extra factor. Mm. So it's square root of two pi times n times what we had before. So this factor, it this derivation is pretty easy. This one requires um, more math. Uh, we're gonna use this one just because it's somewhat better. Um, it's not much better. This one gets you, I don't know, 95% of the way there. And both approximations improve as n increases. So, you know, for the factorial of you know, four factorial or five factorial, uh, I think the discrepancy might be like 10%, but you know, 10 to the 22 factorial, the discrepancy is gonna be like completely negligible. So we can use um, Stirling's approximation. Okay, so we are going to rewrite the multiplicity for the two spin system, which was just the, the um, n choose r, but we're gonna rewrite it with uh, Sterling. So then the multiplicity of number of spins and excess spin, um, and this is really approximately equal, but it's gonna be pretty close to the exact value. Down here, we're gonna have two pi, one half of N plus S to the one half. One half of n plus s to the one half n plus s e to the minus one half n plus s two pi 
uh, one half of n minus s. So this is the other term. This is a one half. One half of n minus s to the one half mm, one half of n minus s sorry e to the minus one half n minus s okay this is the denominator And up here, we're going to have uh, 2 pi n, n to the n, e to the minus n. How does that look? Pretty nasty? Yeah? <laughs> it's kind of long. All right, so yes. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Yep, so that's the uh, distilling approximation. Okay, so with one half n plus s, this is one half of n, one plus two s over n, and one half of n minus s equals one half of n, one minus two s over n. And we can rewrite the whole thing. So, because I am going to need the space, um, this is going to be a little, this is going to be ugly. Okay. Okay, so we can check my notes online. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a few steps. They're just algebra, okay? So I think, you know, if you can see my notes, uh, well, you cannot see them. They're relatively clear. Um, so I have different colors for the quantities that I'm uh, canceling out. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna post them on Blackboard when I get home. So check them out. Mm. So eventually, we end up with uh, this expression. Two to pi to the negative one half, n to the negative one half, two to the n, one plus two, S divided by N to the negative one half 
n one plus two s divided by n. And then the negative one. Okay, so I stopped here because here we're going to come up with a, another mathematical trick. And you know, these tricks are pretty common in, uh, in statistical um, mechanics. So, uh, this term over here, it has, uh, it is uh, quadratic, right? So it has the S squared and the N squared. And this term uh, is linear. And in this approximation, S is much smaller than N. So, uh, we're going to, um, well, not just assume it is true. So the terms that are quadratic are going to be very tiny compared to the ones that are linear. So 4s squared over n squared is going to be very, very close to zero. So and we can just say that this is zero. One minus zero, one. Um, one over the square root of one, one, okay? So this term is very close to one, we can ignore it. Well, we don't ignore it, it's just multiplying times one. And then we have uh, this term over here. If we take the natural log of that term, so natural log of one plus two s divided by n minus one half of n times one plus two s divided by n. That natural log is minus one half of n times one plus two s over n. So the, the exponent over here, natural log of one plus two s over n. Right? So this guy over here. So the power expansion of the natural log of one plus X is X minus X squared divided by two plus X cubed divided by three minus da da da. You can still see that? Yes, okay. Uh, so this is just the Taylor expansion of these. So when x uh, is approximately, well, x is much smaller than one. Okay, so this is what we have over here. We have one, and this term, because s is much smaller than n, this term is gonna be much smaller than one. So we can use the, the power expansion of natural log of one plus X. This is a, 
it's a this power expansion is used um, a lot. Okay, so that means that we can rewrite uh, this expression. as minus one half of n, one plus two s over n. And then for the natural log, we're gonna use the expansion. So, you know, x in this case is two s over n. So two s over n minus 2s squared divided by n squared plus 4s uh, squared. Uh, wait, that's it. Mm, 2s is going to be 4s. Yeah, plus everything else. Mm, so it's going to be, this is minus 2s. There's another, another term that is quadratic. Okay, so it looks like that. Um, we have two of these terms. This one has a plus, and this one uh, is exactly the same, except that it has a negative over here. So we can just do this one for the negative. And that one is gonna be, yeah, I guess the same, just you have the negative here and the negative here. And this one is gonna have a negative here at the beginning. This one is also gonna be negative. This one is gonna be positive. And you have the other terms. So when you uh, multiply both of them, you're going to end up with one half of n, then you're going to have all these terms, 2s over n minus 2s over n plus 2s squared over n squared plus 2s squared over n squared minus 4s cubed over n cubed plus 4s cubed over n cubed plus blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah. So what you can notice is that the terms that are uh, odd, so this is um, linear, this is cubic, they cancel out. You have one positive and one negative. The ones that are uh, even they add together so they don't cancel out. So we're going to keep it to, you know, we're not going to look at the, at the quartic term. So this whole thing is equal to minus 4s squared over 2n, which is equal to minus 2s squared over n, right? So you multiply together these two terms and you get this. So it's starting to look less crazy. Uh, 
Um, oh, this was a this was a natural log. So if we want to put it back as nat not the natural log, this will be the exponent. Okay, so let's rewrite it in a prettier way. So this is going to be um, two over square root of two pi um, two to the n e to the minus two s squared over n. Yes. Mm. Yes, it should be in the bottom. Mm. Yeah, so there will be two. Yeah, this is. Pi n. To the one half. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mm, but you had two on top, and then in the denominator, you had uh, another two. It was a two pi. Okay. So the cool thing about this is that G of n and no spin excess is equal to 2 over pi n to the 1 half 2 to the n. Right, so if you just use the um, the n choose r formula, you get exactly this. So that means that we can rewrite this g n s is equal to the multiplicity of n zero e to the minus two s squared over n. Okay, so it doesn't look that daunting anymore. Um, what shape does this have? What is it? This is a Gaussian, right? So not surprisingly, because this is just a binomial theorem, the shape uh, actually is going to be centered at zero. It's just um, a Gaussian. So here, this is the, this is S, the spin excess. And the top, so the, the maximum value is going to be g of n zero. Okay, so how wide is the the Gaussian? Well, the more general form. Okay, so on. Uh, before I forget, this one 
Mm. This one is equation 1.35. So equation 35, chapter one, Kittel and Cromer. Okay, so we're in that section. So, the general form of the Gaussian is e to the minus x squared divided by two sigma. Um, well, it's x minus mu, you know, the, the, the mean, but we know that the mean is going to be zero. So we can just forget about it. So uh, if this is the Gaussian. That means that the um, one over two sigma This one squared for the Gaussian. I think so, right? Can you check very quickly? Someone in front of a computer? This is standard deviation squared, right? I think so. So That means that n is going to be four sigma squared. And sigma squared is the variance. Okay, so sigma, the standard deviation over here is n over four to the one half. n to the one half divided by two. So how large is n, capital N? Well, it's the number of spins in a, in a magnet or in a magnetic material. Uh, each atom has a spin, so it's going to be of the order of Avogadro's number, right? So 10 to the 22. So well, Avogadro's number is 10 to the 23, but to make it easy, uh, to divide it uh, to get the, the square root. So if n is equal to that, then sigma, the standard deviation, is 1 times 10 to the 11. So it's a pretty big number. But um, if you divide it by, by n, which is the height, you know, essentially the height of this um, Gaussian, then it's 10 to the 11 divided by 10 to the 22. So that is 10 to the negative 11. Okay, so how small is this number? Well, that's uh, 100, one over 100 billion, right? So that is the ratio of the height uh, of, the, of the Gaussian and the, the width of the Gaussian. 
So if n is small, you know, three, four, then this width is not negligible. But as n increases, and especially as it goes to um, like towards Avogadro's number, then this distribution is extremely narrow. And so you will not expect, you know, a magnetic material to align all of its uh, spins in the same direction and suddenly become um, uh, like a permanent magnet, right? You have to apply a magnetic field or something. So this is why uh, statistical mechanics works. Okay. So, yeah, it's going to be close to the height. Yes, same, same order. Okay, so let's. Um, let's continue repeating what we did last time, you know, just with a system that is a little bit more realistic, which is the system with the spins. So after getting you know, the, the Gaussian shape uh, with, the, with the two dice, uh, we calculated the average and the, I mean, the, the mean and the, and the variance, right? So we're gonna do that again, but we're going to do it um, more generally. So we had you know, the expectation value uh, of S, you know, when we added uh, all the, the, the possible values of the sum, two, three, four, five, and so on, times uh, the probability of getting it. So, you know, one, per, one over 36 of getting a two, two over 36 of getting a three, and so on. We multiplied the value times the probability and we added everything together, right? And at the end, we got that that expectation value was seven. So we can write that as the sum you know, of all, all the possible values. And then here is D value. And here will be the probability of getting that value. Then we also got the expectation value of the squared. Right, so we can write that as S squared and then the probability of getting uh, that value. So in general, you can calculate the expectation value of any function uh, that takes the values of, um, of a probability distribution. So it's gonna be S the function of S and the probability of S. So in this case, what is the function? Well, it's just the value that you're getting, right? The sum, so S here, well, is uh, X squared. So the, there are, these are called uh, the moments, and you know, if you remember, like classical mechanics or introductory mechanics, um, you could calculate like the center of mass or the moment of inertia with uh, equations that look a lot like this. That is not a coincidence. Okay, so. 
the zeroth moment is going to be sum of all possible values s to the zero e the, the probability of s so this of course is one so this is just equal to the sum of the probabilities and typically uh, you want the sum of the probabilities to be equal to one, right? So that's that's uh, a constraint that you impose to make things uh, easier to handle. Mm. In classical mechanics, you could have something like this would be R to the zero. Um, this is I, mass of I, and I. What is this? So R, I, no matter what it is, is to the zeroth. So this is just one. What is that? Dun, dun, dun. So if you add the mass of all the particles in a system, you get the total mass of the system, right? So that's the zeroth moment, the first moment. Sum of S, S to the one, P of S, so that is just um, the, ex the mean, right? What we had over here. In mechanics, this will be you know, the particles I, Ri to the one, which is just Ri, Mi. So what does this give you? Gives you the center of mass. So the zero moment is the mass. The first moment is the center of mass um, or the mean if you're in statistics. The second moment S squared, probability of S. Um, so this is just in statistics is the, the variance. Uh, in mechanics, this will give you R squared I times MI. This gives you the moment of inertia, right? So I don't think higher moments are used in, at least commonly in mechanics, um, but in statistics, uh, you can go on. So the third moment, it will be S cubed probability of S. This one is called the mean. This one is called the variance. This one is called the skewness. So if you compute this, it tells you uh, how asymmetric the distribution is. So if you have a Gaussian distribution, it's completely symmetric. And so the third moment is going to be zero. But if you had something you know, that looked 
maybe more like a, you know, let's say Maxwell Boltzmann or something like that, then here this Qness is not zero. It will give you a non-zero value. And the fourth moment, you guessed it, S to the fourth, probability of S. This one is called the kurtosis. So that tells you how heavy the tails are. So if you have a Gaussian that looks like that, and it's a perfect Gaussian, then the, the uh, kurtosis is gonna be zero. But you know, let's say that the tails are really heavy over here. It looks more like that. Then the kurtosis is going to be not zero. Okay, so just remember that you're just uh, using this general form. You have the square, the cube, the, the fourth power. Uh, you multiply times the probability of getting that value. You add everything together. Um, so with our With our um, magnet, let's get the, the zero moment. We have the definition, so S to the zero, uh, probability of S. So this is gonna be just one. And what is this probability for the value S? Well, it's the multiplicity. So G of N uh, and S. So the multiplicity of, of course depends on how many um, spins you have and the excess spin. So, When you add uh, all the possible combinations of the binomial distribution uh, that is equal to two to the n. And you want to normalize the distribution, right? So you can put the normalization factor over here. You want that to be equal to one. So then if you want to uh, normalize your, your, uh, your total probability to one, you have to divide by two to the N. So this value over here is two divided by pi to the N to the one half, two to the N E, to the minus 2s squared over n. And if we divide by 2 to the n to normalize it, uh, we get rid of these 2n, 2 to the n that we had before. And so the sum of all the probabilities should be equal to to that. Okay, so this is the zeroth moment. Mm. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm gonna go to, I had a few more details over there, but I'm gonna go to the first moment. Right, so that's just the definition of the first moment. So we can rewrite these for the case of the spins. It goes from 2s equals negative n to 2s equals n, right? So this is the case where all the spins are pointing down, very unlikely, but it's a, it's a possibility. And this is where all the spins are pointing up. Uh, also very unlikely, but it's a possibility. And you want to sum you know, everything in between. So this is S and then the probability, uh, normalized probability. It's that. And because N, uh, is really big. Again, we can uh, use our trick and approximate it with an integral. So this is a constant. We can take it out of the integral. Um, these are not technically uh, negative infinity and infinity but the area under the curve is going to be so tiny that this is a this is a good approximation. Okay. Uh, that is part. So this particular one, the the first moment is not there. But the second, the second moment is um, look at equation 1.43. So it's page 22. So they look at the zero moment and the second, um, I just decided to stick in the first one in there for completeness. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, So to solve this integral, um, let x squared equals uh, 2s over n. So uh, x is square root of 2 over n s and dx is square root of 2 over n ds, which implies that ds is square root of n over 2 dx. OK, so using this substitution, we can rewrite these integral as
as dead. Okay. And they don't really talk about the first moment in the book because this integral uh, is zero. So this is just the, the Gaussian. And you're multiplying times x, right? So over here is going to be negative. So that whole function is going to look, well, I'm going to leave it here. That whole function is going to look kind of like this. Right, so the area under the curve here um, is the same on both sides. So it is a it is an, an odd function. So if you if the range is symmetric, in this case from negative infinity to infinity, then the whole integral is zero. And well, we knew that, right? The the average of all the spins. Um, is, is zero. So if you just throw them out randomly um, and you do the experiment and you have 10 to the 22 or 10 to the 23 spins, then um, the expectation value is that you have as many spins up as uh, the number of um, spin, spins down. Okay, so I'm gonna stop over here. Um, the last thing that I wanted to cover, you know, oh, it should not take me too long next time, uh, is the second moment. So the second moment is the one that they uh, talked about in the book. So it's very similar. Uh, this is going to be, you know, the only difference is that this is gonna be squared, this is gonna be squared, and this is gonna be three halves. Um, but this, this integral um, is the gamma function. So if you want to solve it, it's going to be extremely difficult, um, but the values are, are tabulated. So uh, this integral is in the appendix of uh, Kittel and Cromer. It is equation, it's appendix A. So equation A5 and A6. Okay, so take a look. Okay, so today we saw that the system with magnetic spins, spins up and down, behaves pretty much the same as the, the dice, um, you know, as expected, because both of them follow the, uh, the binomial, both have a binomial distribution. But when you go to really large values of n, then um, um, the, the distribution becomes uh, extremely narrow. And we learn a few mathematical tricks that uh, you will you will see repeated you know, in this class. Uh, Stirling's approximation, the, the power expansion of the natural log of one plus X uh, and these, uh, these integrals, uh, which you see a lot in, in probability. Um, without the squared, this is the uh, error function. And yeah, this is the, the gamma function. All right. so. Thank you, I'm sorry for being a little bit late. I'm going to stop recording.